title of my talk is The Woman at the Well and the Wellspring of Holiness. And today is All Saints Day, the feast of the great heroes of holiness. We all want to be saints. We all want to dedicate ourselves to the adventure, to the vocation of holiness. And that is why you have come here to the beautiful city of Memphis for this glorious Magnificat Day of Joy. But where does it all start? Here's the thing. Holiness begins in something we don't like to think about, and that knowledge is the wellspring of holiness. What do I mean? I don't have any idea. No, I'm only kidding. Yes, I do. Think about your favorite saints. So, if you were to compile a list of your favorite saints at the top of the list, of course, would be St. Francis of Assisi. That's a given. But then, in the top 10 or 20, that would be probably St. Augustine, St. Thomas Becket, St. Ignatius of Loyola, St. Peter and St. Paul. You might even throw in St. Mary of Egypt. What do all of these illustrious saints have in common? they were all notorious sinners. Their sanctity began in their knowledge of their sins, in the acknowledgement of being a sinner. Because, as our loving Savior Jesus Christ tells us very plainly and directly, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. We laud and venerate the saints. That's the point of today's solemnity. But what does that former world-class champion sinner, now ever-shining doctor of the church, St. Augustine, tell us. He says, our lives should be praised only when we continue to beg for pardon. And the reason why Jesus carves time out of his busy schedule to have his encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well is precisely because She is a sinner. She is living in an adulterous relationship with a man, one of many. But something strange. Very often in my preaching, when I talk to people about sin and ask them to comment about their own sins, their response often is, what is sin? I I, I don't don't commit sins. I'm a good person. At which point, I usually break into a stanza of, Immaculate Mary, your praises we sing. You reign now in splendor with Jesus our King. Wait, wait, don't get, hey, hey, don't get carried away. And then when I get to the part of Ave, 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 I say, insert your own name. Because the Blessed Virgin Mary is the only person I ever met who is immaculately conceived. That is, she's the only person I know who's never committed a sin. No, we're sinners. Remember that interview that our Holy Father, Pope Francis, conducted in August of 2013? The first question that the interviewer asked him was, who is Jorge Mario Bergoglio? And and Pope Francis responded, I am a sinner. This is the most accurate definition. It is not a figure of speech, a literary genre. genre. I am a sinner. But we really don't like thinking about sins. It's like somebody talking about worms while we're eating spaghetti. (laughs) St. Dorotheus, a 6th century abbot from Gaza, Palestine, said this. The reason for all disturbance, if we look to its roots, is that no one finds fault with himself. This is the source of all annoyance and distress. This is why we sometimes have no rest, but we have no other path to peace but this. We have seen that this is true in many cases, and in our laziness and desire for rest, we hope or believe that we have entered upon a straight path when we are impatient with everyone and yet cannot bear to blame ourselves. This is the way we are. It does not matter how many virtues a person may have, even if they are beyond number and limit, if he has turned from the path 
of self-accusation, he will never find peace. He will always be troubled himself or else he will be a source of trouble for others and all his labors will be wasted. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes, you do. Or the newest craze. When it's time to sing that magnificent classic hymn, Amazing Grace, what do people frequently do? They delete the words that saved a wretch like me. What's up with that? <laughs> That's messed up. You're not a wretch? Isn't sin wretched? Do you ever commit a sin? No? Immaculate me. Monsignor Luigi Gisani, servant of God, in a talk once said, how do you approach the mystery? Do you go making packs? Do you go making a contract? Do you go preparing yourself and then saying, now I have the right to come and approach you? Do you approach the mystery first by setting things in order yourself and then saying, now then, you are forced to accept me here. This would be pretension and presumption. Approaching the mystery requires only one thing, the awareness of our ineptitude, which is more than nothingness of our basic incapacity and our continuous betrayal of our culpable poverty, of our conniving incapacity of our being nothing. I don't know about you, but when I listen to these words, I feel a great liberation because I am a sinner. Again and again, we need to call to mind those famous words of St. Paul in the letter to the Romans, which are like a cry piercing his heart. I cannot even understand my own actions I do not do what I want to do, but what I hate. The desire to do right is there in my flesh, but not the power to do right. What happens is that I do not the good I will to do, but the evil I do not intend. What a wretched man I am. Who can free me from this body under the power of death? So then what do we mean by sin? Because you're saying to yourself, I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't burned down anyone's house. That's a good start. Don't give that up. But it's, it's, it's a question, it's a big question. And maybe, maybe most of the prevalent sins that the majority of us can accuse ourselves are boil down to these, basic list. Selfishness, envy, resisting God, sins of omission. The great French Catholic author of the 20th century, Léon Blois, once said, the worst evil is not committing crimes, but failing to do the good one could do, and also not doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. Pope Benedict XVI once remarked, sin appears when a person refuses to recognize his own limits and tries to be completely self-sufficient. And what does sin do to us? What are the effects of sin in our life? St. Thomas Aquinas says, and I learned this from Father Robert Barron's Catholicism film. <laughs> yeah. I know what you're thinking. <clears throat> Sin is being caved in on ourselves. I stole it from him. As the author George Bernanos puts it, Sin makes us live on the surface of ourselves. And he's sort of our man of the day because he's the one who's proposing holiness as an adventure. Or in another place he says, sin is a kind of vampire. I offer that to you for those of you who were dressed thusly last night. <clears throat> you consider the sins of the Samaritan woman. I don't think she woke up every morning purposefully deciding to be a vicious person, do you? I mean, many of the sins that we commit in life are sins of weakness. No, they're not sins of malice. Who knows why the woman had so many husbands? So much of our sinning is brought on simply from fear. As Simone Weil commented, every sin is an attempt to fly from emptiness. The Argentinian poet Jorge Luis Borges wrote a beautiful poem that well could be what the Samaritan woman said to herself every day as she trudged her way to the well. Listen to this. 
I have committed the worst sin that anyone could commit. I have not been happy. My parents begot me for the risky and beautiful game of life. I cheated them. I was not happy. Their wish for their child was unfulfilled. My mind applied itself to useless arguments woven into nothing. It doesn't abandon me. It is always at my side, the shadow of having been a wretch. The proof of it is the hour that the woman chooses to come to the well. The Scripture says, the hour was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. It's probably 100 degrees at noon in the Holy Land. Why would the woman choose the hottest, most arduous hour to go about the back-breaking work of collecting water and carrying it home? And the answer is very simple. She didn't want to be there at a time when other people would be there. She didn't want to be sub, su subject herself to other people's gossip, to their judging her, their derision and contempt. She didn't want to be reminded of the evil that had become a regular part of her life. Sin makes us solitary and lonely. The woman has everything she wants, but she doesn't belong to anyone and belonging. Belonging is everything. What do we call receiving the Eucharist at Mass. It's Holy Communion. She doesn't even belong to the man she lives with. Pope Benedict once wrote, the root of the human being's wretchedness is loneliness, is the absence of love, is the fact that my existence is not embraced by a love that makes it necessary, that is strong enough to justify it despite all the pain and limitations it imposes. Maybe the Samaritan woman lapsed into sin because she was longing for just such a love, and it constantly eluded her. Because we are lonely, we sin. But because we sin, we end up achingly lonely. Dominican Father B. Jarrett, an English Dominican, in a profound way explained this catch-22 of sin and loneliness when he wrote, sin makes a person realize, as nothing else does, the terrible loneliness of life. After an offense against God, human nature feels itself to shrivel up and become cut off from the rest of the world. The parched and thirsty soul feels the need of the dew of God and rushes madly as the beasts wander in the jungle looking for the water they cannot find. The soul by sin is thus made solitary. My sins will not let me feel that inward presence that is the sole real source of peace here below. I was created by love for love, and when by sin I act contrary to love, my heart must necessarily feel his absence. In Evelyn Waugh's celebrated novel, Brides Had Revisited, a guilt-ridden character named Julia Marchmain is living in an adulterous relationship with Charles Ryder. Julia obsesses about that, quote, one little flat deadly word that covers a lifetime. And the word is sin. And she goes on to say, <clears throat> living in sin with sin, by sin, for sin, every hour, every day, year in, year out, waking up with sin in the morning, seeing the curtains drawn on it, bathing it, dressing it, clipping diamonds to it, feeding it, showing it round, giving it a good time, putting it to sleep at night. Poor Julia, they say, she can't go out. She's got to take care of her little sin. Julia's so good to her little mad sin. So, isolated, alienated, marginalized, stigmatized, the Samaritan woman drags herself each day to that hellish well and comes away more parched and arid than when she left home. But we have to remember something about the significance of wells in the Bible. Wells are the biblical places of engagement and espousal. Wells are where marriage proposals happen. In sacred scriptures, wells lead to weddings. St. John Paul II writes in one of his plays, the bridegroom is the living denial of all loneliness. If I knew how to implant myself in him, if I knew how to live in him, 
I would find in myself the love that fills him. Little does the Samaritan woman know that she is about to meet that bridegroom and be given the way to implant herself in him. So you can imagine the woman's surprise when she arrives at the well, only to discover that there's someone else there horning in on what's supposed to be her private time. Not only is there someone there, that someone is a stranger and a man and a Jew, the Samaritan's mortal enemy. John the Evangelist, for some reason, goes out of his way to tell us that Jesus sat down at the well tired from his journey. Why does John go to the bother of informing us about the Lord's physical condition? that Jesus was tired. Why does that matter? Well, think about it. If Jesus, at that particular moment, were fresh and robust and strong and energetic, full of vim and vigor, and you, a woman, were to find yourself alone with him in that deserted spot, you might fear instinctually being attacked by that man. So Christ appears tired and worn out so that the woman will see he is not capable of interested in hurting her so that she will not be afraid. As St. Augustine explains it, not for nothing was Jesus tired. The strength of Christ created you. The weakness of Christ recreated you. With His strength, He created us. With His weakness, He came to seek us out. But another reason, as tired as Jesus is, the woman is even more tired from lugging around her sin. Do you remember that closing scene from that awesome movie, The Help? The film is set in Jackson, Mississippi in 1963 during the Civil Rights era. The National Civil Rights Museum is right here in Memphis. And it is about a number of African-American women who work as maids in white households under appalling oppression. The maids find a way of exposing the racism of their employers, and one of the employers, the particularly hateful and vindictive Hilly Holbrook, conspires to get even. She frames her friend's maid, Abilene Clark, accusing her of stealing silverware and threatening to send her to prison for it, as she had done so previously to another maid. When Hilly is at the very peak of her venom and rage, and about to call the police, Abilene walks right up to her, looks her in the eye, and says to her, all you do is scare and lie to try to get what you want. You are godless woman. Then switching to a tone of total mercy and tenderness, she says, ain't you tired, Miss Hilly? Ain't you tired? Abilene is on to something. Sin makes us tired. It wears us out. Sin is a kind of vampire. Jesus comes to the well, tired and worn, to be the Samaritan, for the Samaritan woman, a kind of mirror. In his outward appearance, he resembles the way she feels inside. When she sees him, she sees herself. The same verb for being tired is used, I think, in just one other place in the gospel, at least in this way. And where is that? In Matthew 11, where we hear Jesus beckon us and say, Come to me, all you who are weary and find life burdensome, and I will refresh you. Notice who gets to the well first, Jesus, not the woman which reflects a key teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. In the very first paragraph of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which I know you have memorized, but I'll say it anyway, (laughs) it says, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. And then just a few paragraphs later, in case we've forgotten this, it reminds us again and says, God never ceases to draw man to himself. You may have read last week about the death of Monsignor Lorenzo Abbasete, a brilliant theologian, counselor to cardinals and popes, personal friend of St. John Paul II, whom the La Stampa Vatican Insider referred to as one of the most influential figures of the United States Church in recent decades. He was my friend. Monsignor Abbasete accompanied Pope John Paul II on his papal visit to Cuba in 1998. 
And after the Holy Father left the room where he was meeting with Fidel Castro, Monsignor Albacete had a chance to speak to Castro privately. He spoke to him about Jesus Christ, and Castro was struck by Monsignor Albacete's words because it is reported that Castro said that the priest he had met as a boy had never presented the subject to him in such a way. As the end was drawing near for Monsignor Albacete, he became aware of it, and he asked someone who was with him in the hospital room to write down his last words. The last words of Monsignor Lorenzo Abbasetti are these. You see, Jesus always comes. He wants to be with us. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, if only you recognized God's gift and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him instead and he would have given you living water. New Yorker magazine is famous for its cartoons. There are certain stock themes that keep popping up, like the one of the robe and bearded God in heaven looking down upon the earth, or a shipwrecked person who is marooned on a desert island, or the cloaked and scythe-carrying grim reaper going about his business. Another recurring type is the cartoon of a guy stranded in the desert, wandering aimlessly through the sand and dying of thirst. In a recent rendition, the cartoon shows a lost man on his hands and knees who has crawled through the desert, but he manages to crawl himself into one of those big box superstores. And there he cries out, water! And the store clerk looks at him and says, aisle 17. <laughs> the cartoon is funny because it captures something of our own experience. Right in the midst of civilization, we can still be dying of thirst. The water we crave is right there, but we don't know it. Thirst makes us aware that we need something more than ourselves. We look to others to give it to us. Thirst is terrible, as our crucified Savior witnesses to on, to on the cross, making the cry, I thirst, one of his seven last words. But one of Jesus' first words, which the bishop referred to today in his gospel, in the Beatitudes, in his homily, is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for holiness. They shall have their fill. Jesus is thirsty for our thirst. Thirsting for holiness begins in the awareness that we are not yet holy, that sin is a problem in our life with which we must contend. This theme of the desire for holiness as thirst runs all through the Bible. So Psalm 42, as the deer longs for running streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. A thirst is my soul for God, the living God. When shall I go and behold the face of God? Or Psalm 63, O God, you are my God whom I seek. For you my flesh pines and my soul thirsts. Or Psalm 142, like a parched land, my soul thirsts for you. Or the prophet Isaiah, the Lord will give you the water for which you thirst. No longer will your teacher hide himself, but with your own eyes you shall see your teacher. And that prophecy gets fulfilled in John 7, 37, where we hear Jesus cry out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Just to mention a few citations. We have to feel thirsty in order to find ourselves, because to be human is to be thirst. The French Dominican theologian Father Bernard Bro points out, whether or not we wish, we cannot escape the thirst for happiness. We are made for it. Whether or not we wish, we cannot acquire it without human means. We actually enter into collaboration with God when we begin our search for happiness. But we must be constantly won over by God. God himself knows this. Thus, he makes our lives a long labor requiring patience in order, show, in order to show us each day a little more clearly who He is and who we are. This is one of the most mysterious areas of our life. This part of our life is our desire. That is the reason for our Lord's encounter with the woman at the well, to win her over through her long labor, a collaboration with Him, an engagement of her desire. 
Salvation from our sins, the beginning of true morality, comes about precisely through such an encounter. Pope Francis has said, only someone who has encountered mercy, who has been caressed by the tenderness of mercy, is happy and comfortable with the Lord. In front of this merciful embrace, we feel a real desire to respond, to change, to correspond. A new morality arises. Christian morality is simply a response. It is a heartfelt response to a surprising, unforeseeable, unjust mercy. The surprising, unforeseeable, unjust mercy of one who knows me, knows my betrayals, and loves me just the same, appreciates me, embraces me, calls me again, hopes in me, and expects from me. In his commentary on this passage about the woman at the well, Pope Benedict wrote, The woman is made aware of what in actuality she, like every human being, has always known, but to which she has not always averted, that she thirsts for life itself, and that all the assuaging that that she seeks and finds cannot satiate this living elemental thirst. During the years 1993 to 1995, I was a campus minister at um, the Catholic Center at New York University. Not long ago, a student from about 20 years back sent me an email, a student whom I will call Michelle, and this is what she wrote. I spent most of April to August in bed, devastated, going through the most painful experience of my life. My entire life seemed so empty, I guess that's what happens when there's such an imbalance with work and there weren't enough pieces left to fill what it once was. I didn't ever want to go outside because seeing people together made me feel all that much more alone. Couples reminded me I was still waiting for a great love. The sun still shone. Light and color were painful. A simple errand became a caustic reminder of how I viewed the world, which would never be the same. People who I thought would always be there for me let me down. You felt like this sometimes, right? She goes on. I tried to volunteer at a rescue shelter, hoping that would snap me out of my depression. In each dog, I saw a loving being discarded because it was suddenly no longer wanted, which was how I felt. And still, it could still express joy with a wagging tail. For me, it hurt to even breathe. I couldn't remember the last time I had been happy. I wondered if I forgot how to be happy. I forgot what hope looked like and wondered where God went. The flames from the wreckage of my life had to be visible from space. Where were my rescue teams? Maybe he forgot about me. Then I heard your voice in my head say, you have to think about what it is you really need. And when you figure that out, then ask God for help. Don't expect him to just automatically fix your problems. You have to offer up your need to him, which you said to me a lot at the Catholic Center. And I really thought about it, and I came up with this. I need for someone to pick me up because I have been knocked down so hard this time, I don't think I can get up on my own. And after I said that, I knew the difference. The prayers I say every day are thanks for what I have and requests for those I love. The expression of need is the complete and absolute surrender of myself to something greater. For me, I had to fall completely apart. Every single one of those padlocked doors had to fall away one by one, and I had to give up every ounce of control I've clutched to all these years. I've always taken care of me and have always had a very strong independent spirit, but in hindsight, I realize how ridiculous it was. I had to go through that horrible time so that I could let God help me. Maybe that's why I haven't found the great love yet. It's because I wasn't able to give myself over completely. I was still a solo act. Maybe the reason people don't see burning bushes these days is because they would call the fire department. (laughs) I like to think God is still reaching out to us. We just have to look. It's quite something. It was her thirst for a great love that moved Michelle to recognize God's gift, as Jesus calls it as he says to the woman at the well. And what is that? The author Francois Mauriac responds, God's gift is precisely the opposite of anguish. 
But just when everything was going so well, and the woman who was so rude to Jesus, not even calling him by any title when she first meets him, but now referring to him as sir, is finally warming up to him, so much so that he, she gets up the gumption to say, sir, give me this water so that I will not grow thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. It's just at that moment that the Lord throws her an incredible curveball. He says, go, call your husband and then come back here. And she replies, I have no husband. Now, this, of course, is concrete spiritual proof that the Samaritan woman at the well went to a Jesuit university. <laughs> because what the woman says is, is not a lie, right? No. What is it then? It's broad mental reservation. Broad mental reservation is an element of classic Jesuit moral theology. What do we mean by broad mental reservation? I hope you're taking notes. Mental reservation is an act of the mind whereby in the course of conversation we restrict the sense of the words used to a meaning different from their obvious meaning. If a prudent person could gather the intended meaning from the surrounding circumstances, then it is broad mental reservation. Broad mental reservation is a concealment of truth which in certain circumstances is not only permitted, but even necessary. Generally speaking, however, mental reservation should be used as little as possible in the course of conversation, and especially if you're having a conversation with God. <clears throat> now, why does she do this? Because she is, here's the word, blackmailed by her sin. She knows that living with a man out of wedlock is wrong. It is shame that prompts her to try to cover up and cam camouflage the damning fact. And we do this all the time. We live under the sway of the devil's blackmail. What are the signs that we are blackmailed by our sins? Well, have you ever gone to confession, keep this to yourself, have you ever gone to confession <clears throat> and done any of these things? Deliberately leave out certain sins because you were too ashamed to say them out loud. Conceal important details about a sin, downplaying how grave your sinning was because you know it makes you look bad. Tell yourself that certain sins really aren't sins, and therefore you don't have to confess them. Put the blame for your sins on something or someone else. Or rationalize and think, yeah, my sins are bad, but other people's sins are much worse, so I don't need to be concerned about my own sins. I'll give you an example of this. So let's say you're driving in your car on the highway, and uh, it's a 55-mile-an-hour zone. You're driving 65 miles an hour. What's the happiest thing you could see at that instant? It is somebody driving 75 miles an hour, right? <laughs> right, it is, it is. Why? Because you say to yourself, okay, we're both breaking the law, but that guy's going to get nabbed. <laughs> and at that point, even though you're both violating the law, You've, you've, you've done something with your sins, that is not the way to deal with sins, and it, it amounts to a kind of a blackmail, but we do it all the time. So how does the Lord then respond to this woman's very clever maneuver? Jesus does something that at first blush might seem terribly cruel. He exposes her sins to her and all their enormity. Imagine this, you know, you walk out into the, you know, I don't know, concession room, and someone says, oh, yeah, I remember you. You did the X, Y, and Z in 1947, whatever it is. <laughs> it's not a good way to make friends. You are right, he says to her. You are right in saying you have no husband. The fact is that you have had five, and the man you were living with was not your husband. Isn't this sort of cold-hearted and a brutal thing to do to a person? No, it, it's just the opposite of cruel. It's what Pope Francis would call, as he puts it in the joy of the gospel, aggressive tenderness. This is fantastic. You know, I'm, I, 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 I'm getting t-shirts with that on it. They're, and they're going to they're gonna be a little ripped, you know? So, because here's the thing. Here's the thing. For in the, in, in the providence of divine mercy, the more God lets us see the truth of what we are in ourselves, the more He gives us the grace to cling to Him. Do you think he's ever going to let you see something despicable about you and leave you that way? God would be a pervert. God gives us the grace to see the truth of ourself 
so that through that knowledge, we're given the greater grace to cling to Him. That is why the woman does not reject Jesus or run away from Him once He lays bare the terrible truth of her sins. God desires to bind us to Himself in the very knowledge of how lost we would be outside of Him. We all want God to bind us to Himself in the knowledge of our perfect report card. That's, that puts God out of, out of a job when we do that. God wants to des desires, longs to bind us to Himself in the very knowledge of how lost we would be outside of Him. For as Monsignor Giussani says, even if we have sinned and our heart reproaches us, God is greater than our hearts. The woman needs to know that Jesus knows the worst things about her, and in knowing that, He does not condemn her. Here's the thing. What if Jesus didn't reveal her sins to her? What would have happened? She would have walked away, and later the black male would have kicked in again because at a certain point she would have said to herself, this man is exceptional in so many ways, but if he knew the real me, if he knew how terrible and horrible my sins are, he would never love me or accept me. And she would be lost and trapped all over again in her black mail. All our sins, says Father Julian Caron, have the dimension of unfaithfulness to ourselves. And in the words of Pope Benedict, the woman is brought face to face with herself by finally being able to confront her sins. Only at this point does the offering of Jesus' true gift become possible. Now the woman is aware of the real thirst by which she is driven, and she can at last learn what it is for which her own thirst thirsts. Or as the poet Rainer Maria Rilke expresses it, it is here in the pieces of my shame that I find myself. And what is the true gift that Jesus offers the Samaritan woman? The gift of God the Father. Jesus says an hour is coming when authentic worshipers will worship the Father. Jesus gives the woman a relationship with his own Father. And one of the hallmarks of God the Father, and this is a quality, a distinction that every true earthly father is intended, designed to share, is that a father is someone who knows the worst about you and who, in knowing it, loves you all the more. Why? Because you need to be loved. Ultimately, being yourself means being a sinner who wants to be loved by God. The Gospel story tells us the woman left her water jar and went into town. What John leaves out is that they had just got indoor plumbing, so no, that's not it. <clears throat> it's symbolic. It's symbolic. <clears throat> so what does the water jar signify? It is the symbol of the woman's old life, her lies, her excuses, her, her compromises, her cynicism, her self-sufficiency, her bitterness, her anger, her, her passions, her making herself the measure of everything. Love turns the Samaritan woman into a missionary. She runs back to town and evangelizes everyone who lives there. She cries out, come and see someone who told me everything I ever did. That is, she dares to tell the whole world her scandalous life story. How is she able to do such a thing? St. John Chrysostom replies, when the soul is on fire with the divine fire, it no longer pays attention to earthly things, neither to glory nor to shame, but only to that flame that holds it fast. And then St. John of the Cross adds to that, the Samaritan woman forgot the water and the water pot because of the sweetness of God's words. This soul is so close to God that it is transformed into a flame of love in which the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are communicated to it. The wellspring of our holiness is living with a healthy sense of sin. As Monsignor Giussani testifies, all my human hope in the salvation of Christ has grown because of my perception of being a sinner. In the long run, whoever recognizes himself as a sinner with all the pain involved 
the mark of intensity of one's desire, must surely be on the road to true self-realization as a human being, one who belongs to Christ. Leon Blois offers this chilling admonition. Today, sanctity is laid on our doorstep by a wild-eyed, blood-smeared messenger. Behind him, a few steps behind him, are panic, fire, pillage, torture, despair, the most frightful death. What Blois says about what is behind us may in fact be so, but what is in front of us is a thirsty, road-weary man who sits on a well waiting for us in the loneliness of our sin, eager for us to ask for living water, for God's gift, for Him.